As always, it's a great privilege to be before you once again. Thankful for every opportunity to stand before you in this manner. If you would be turning over to the seventh chapter of the book of Mark. Mark chapter 7. We'll be spending quite a bit of time there this morning. But before we do so, I would like to call your minds to the fifth chapter of the book of Matthew. In this chapter, the first chapter, what we typically refer to as the Sermon on the Mount, we find a list of what we refer to as the Beatitudes, or those blessed attitudes. Each of these reveals the character of those who would inhabit the kingdom of God. Not that one person would possess one quality, another person would possess another quality, but those who would be in that kingdom would possess all of these qualities. This chapter shows the rewards to be received by those who would possess each of these qualities. Now some of these qualities include those who are poor in spirit, which refers to the humbleness of mind, specifically with one's spiritual poverty in mind, those mourners, those mourning specifically their sinfulness, and those who would hunger and thirst after righteousness which would ultimately be the proper response to one's spiritual condition. Now, unfortunately, many do not, do not fully appreciate the full extent of their spiritual poverty, thus the great need for righteousness. Left unchecked, the heart of man can become quite wicked. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 3 and Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9. Instead of having this great concern for their spiritual poverty, many continue to follow the machinations of their own devising. Proverbs chapter 14 verse 12 and chapter 16 verse 25. While man can poorly judge the heart and even judge the heart well sometimes based on actions. There is one who knows the hearts of men, and that is Jesus, the Son of God. Mark chapter 2, verse 8, and Revelation chapter 2, verse 23. Who better then to adequately, adequately describe those things which indeed, indeed defile one's heart, which is what we'll be discussing this morning the defilements of the heart, found in Mark chapter 7. First we consider our text. Mark chapter 7, we'll begin with the first five verses. It says, Then came together unto him the Pharisees, and certain of the scribes, which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say, with unwashing hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the market, <clears throat> except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be which they have received to hold, as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels, and of tables. <clears throat> when the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashing hands? So we see here <clears throat> the Pharisees put a challenge to Jesus. They questioned why his disciples ate with unwashing hands. Verse 2. And by doing so, they convicted him, as was his disciples, for violating the traditions of the elders, verses 3 and 5. 
But then we see the response of Jesus. This is found in verses 6 through 13 of Mark 7. He answered and said unto them, Well hath Esaias prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold, tra hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups, and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother. Whoso curseth mother or father, let him die the death. But ye say, If a man shall say to his father or mother, It is Corban, that is to say, a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by, or by me he shall be free. And ye, and ye suffer him no more to do aught for his mother or his mother, or his father or his mother, excuse me, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. So Jesus makes his response, his defense to the criticism. Jesus points out that these people, the Pharisees and scribes, the Jews in general elevate the tradition of the elders above God's word. This makes their worship to God hypocritical and vain. He even uses their practice of Corban to illustrate this point. According to the ISBE, page 709, Corban is a gift or sacrificial offering. Literally, that which is brought near. It is the most general term for a sacrifice of any kind. In the course of time, it became associated with, in, with an objectionable practice. Anything dedicated to the temple by pronouncing the votive, or that is ritual word, Corban, forthwith belonged to the temple, but only ideally. In actuality, it might remain in possession of him who made the vow. So a son might be justified in not supporting his older parents simply because he designated his property or even just a small part of his property as a gift to the temple, that is, Corban. There was no necessity of fulfilling his vow, yet he was actually prohibited from ever using said property for the support of his parents. This shows clearly why Christ singled out this queer regulation in order to demonstrate the sophistry of tradition and to bring out the fact of its possible and actual hostility to the scripture and even the spirit who gave it. So they would dedicate a certain portion of their property to this ritual word Corban, yet never perform the vow never actually fully dedicated to the temple, but because of these traditions, they were freed from that vow. Thus, they rendered the word of God through no effect through their traditions. So there he responded to the Pharisees. Secondly, we see his response to the multitude. He directs his attention to the multitude around him. This is found in verses 14 and 16, where he says, and, he, and when he had called all the people unto him, he said unto them, Hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand. There is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. Nothing that will actually enter a man will defile him. True defilement comes from within the man. <clears throat> we'll have a little bit more to speak on regarding this later. Then we notice his third response, and this was specifically to his disciples. Again, Mark chapter 7, but now in verses 17 through 23. And when he was entered into the house from the people... 
his disciples asked him concerning the parable. And he said unto them, Are ye so without understanding also? Do ye not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man, it goeth into the draft? <clears throat> Excuse me. It, it cannot defile him. Verse 19. Because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly, and goeth out into the draft, purging all meats. And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. You think of all the food that has been consumed over this last weekend. I mean, we are in America. We take things to the extreme. Thankfully, that turkey did not defile the man. However, the wickedness that man devises, that's what defiles the man. We see from this passage that we've just read that his disciples requested an explanation of his teaching. He used the intake of food to illustrate his point. That which we consume passes through our stomach and ultimately goes to be digested and eventually the body eliminates it. We find in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3-5, through 5, speaking of meats, which God have created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. So there's nothing wrong with the food itself. There's nothing in the food that will defile the man. However, Jesus points to what actually does defile us. And that is the evil which proceeds out of the unchecked heart of man. Now in this passage of Mark chapter 7, we see the use of defile in two different ways. The Pharisees were more concerned about the ritualistic standpoint of defile. That is, whether things were actually clean or ceremonially washed. This is the sense in which they used defilement more of an outward appearance type thing. <laughs> Thus they upheld the tradition of washing their hands before eating. Now, I'm not saying we should never wash our hands before eating. Especially being around little boys, you know how dirty their hands can get. Washing hands is a good idea, especially before a meal. However, one will not lose their soul by forgetting to wash their hands before having a common meal. Now, in contrast to this, we see how Jesus uses the word defile, which would be a much more important sense. Again, hearkening to the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, page 819 says this about defile. Defilement in the New Testament teaching, therefore, is uniformly ethical or spiritual the two constantly merging. Whatever use God may have made of ideas and feelings common among the many nations in some form, the divine purpose was clearly to impress deeply and indelibly, which is permanently, on the Israelites, the ideas of holiness and sacredness in general, also of Jehovah's holiness, and their own required holiness and separateness in particular, thus preparing for the deep New Testament teachings of sin and of spiritual consecration and sanctification. So again, pointing to the fact that the Old Testament law of Moses was a schoolmaster, the idea was to take these laws and to point to something far better, that is, the law of Christ. So had these Pharisees and scribes been learning as they should have been, they would have understood what Jesus was trying to say. 
that while it might be a good thing to clean these different vessels, the pots, the cups, even the tables, and certainly washing your hands, while those are good things, there is something else much far better, much more important, of keeping clean. To further illustrate this concept of defilement, return to Matthew chapter 5. Jesus takes these principles that were found in the law of Moses, but then he makes a spiritual application. He shows them how the Jews at the time should be using the law of Moses to make the applications that they should be making. As previously noted, the Pharisees were guilty of promoting the ritualistic traditions of, their, of the elders in such a way that the word of God became null and void and was altogether neglected by them. But we see that Jesus addresses the real problem. Mankind has a heart problem. And I'm not talking about heart issues like heart attacks. However, this would certainly fall under the category of a spiritual heart attack. In verses 20 through 23 of Mark 7, we'll read these, these verses again. And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defiles the man. From within, out of the heart of men, Again, putting the focus where it must be, the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. So we see that Man's unbridled heart is the source of much evil. Verses 20 through 22 here. And this evil is what truly defiles the person. Verse 23. Also again referring to Proverbs chapter 14 verse 12. Chapter 16 verse 25. It seems like there is always a way that seems right unto man. But every one of those ways leads to death. Now, I would like to spend some time breaking down these different words that Jesus used, these different aspects that indeed defile the man. First, he uses evil thoughts. That might come as a surprise, but it's a very simple concept. It's the foundation for all these other sins. Evil thoughts... This concept is a very general idea. The thoughts of one's heart combine with the will and ultimately produce evil actions and or words. The thought has to come from somewhere. Proverbs chapter 23, the first part of verse 7, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Building upon these evil thoughts come adulteries. This is any sexual relation committed by a married person. Matthew chapter 5 verse 28. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4. People violating God's will on the matter of marriage. Next he, he calls fornications. These are any sexual activities of various kinds between non-married people, specifically. Now this would include homosexuality, rape, incest, and pornography. Then there's murders. This is the intentional taking of life, which would be in contrast to accidental or justifiable homicides such as health or self-defense. You might say premeditated murder. Then there's thefts, which would be stealing, taking something that does not belong to you. Sometimes that gets labeled as borrowing forever. This would include shoplifting, 
and even in the thought of the student loan forgiveness program. That is a form of theft. Then there's covetousness, which covers fraud, greediness. This makes one an idolater. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Then there's wickedness. While all of this is wicked, this is a very interesting term. It's not just plotting to do evil activities, but it's driven by malice, by hatred. Then there's deceit. This is attempting to trick others through guile or subtlety. You're lying. Then there's lasciviousness. It's a term that we don't typically use anymore. But this describes conduct that is unbecoming, indecent, or unrestrainedly shameless, unconcealed immoral behavior. People nowadays do not have the ability, it seems, to, to blush whenever they commit a sin. This would be included in this concept of lasciviousness. <clears throat> then there's an evil eye. An evil eye. That is to look with ill will. You might call it the stink eye sometimes. However, this refers primarily to envy. Now using the ISBE, I found this <clears throat> definition or really an explanation of the difference between jealousy and envy. And I think we oftentimes overlook the difference. We kind of make those into synonyms. But jealousy fears to lose what it has. Jealousy fears to lose what it has. In contrast, envy is pained at seeing others have. Thus the evil eye. You hate others for the things that they have in their possession. <clears throat> then there's blasphemy, which is slander or verbal abuse against God or even man, such as taking the Lord's name in vain or using euphemisms that do the same. Then he references pride, which is arrogance. It is an, a boastful opinion of oneself, which typically includes the hatred of others. <laughs> And then he uses the word foolishness. This refers to those who are morally reckless. They lack common sense. Uh, they're morally or spiritually insensitive. These defiling traits are labeled elsewhere in scripture as the works of the flesh. Galatians chapter 5 verses 19 through 21 which reads, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in the time past, they that, wit, that, that they which could do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Further expounding on the idea that Jesus laid out for us. Anyone who performs these acts or a combination of them cannot look forward to heaven as their eternal home without repentance. We must note that human tradition with the external rituals, cannot properly address the real problem. Instead, they do the opposite. They make matters worse. Now, what does this matter for us? What does this mean for us to today? How does this apply to us? Well, first off, we must realize that this is a problem. Secondly, we must take this problem quite seriously. It's not something in far lands. Oh, it's an issue, but we'll never see it. 
No, this is at our doorstep. This is something that we personally can and more likely have dealt with before from a personal standpoint. We must know that mankind has always had a heart problem. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 as well as chapter 8 verse 21. Thus, we're all sinners. James chapter 1 verses 14 and 15. Romans chapter 3 verse 23. Now that is not to say that we are born sinners. We choose to sin. Sin is a very enjoyable thing to engage in. All the more dangerous and all the more it needs our attention. As such, we become slaves to sin. John chapter 8 verse 34 and Romans chapter 7 verses 18 through 20. Unless this problem is adequately addressed, one could die physically due to the practicing of these different defilers. You think of each of these different traits, the 13 that we named off. People tend to take revenge on others for doing these things. You think of committing adultery. Don't you think there's an angry spouse out there? And who knows, maybe they both might be engaged in that, but there's still another party out there that probably might have some possession. That's my spouse. You're trespassing in my house. And this is Texas. That sort of thing could get you shot. Thus, practicing these different sins could, to lead, could lead to one's physical death. But more importantly, practicing these defilers, these defilements, could cause one to die spiritually. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. And going on unrepented will cause one to die eternally. That is to lose their soul in a devil's hell for eternity. After the, the life in this flesh is over. Revelation 21 verse 8. Thankfully there is a solution. And that solution is found in the very word of God. The Bible contains the power to save souls. James chapter 1 verse 21. It is God's power unto salvation. Romans chapter 1 verses 16 and 17. It points to the one, Jesus, who offers true freedom from sin. John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, as well as verse 36. It is he and he alone who offers freedom from the guilt of sin through his blood. Matthew chapter 26, verse 28. And Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Jesus offers freedom from the power of sin through his word. Romans chapter 8, verses 9 through 14. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. And Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. The solution to the sin problem, particularly the heart problem, is the plan of salvation. Hearing God's word is the first step. Romans 10, 17. Growing a belief in Christ as the Son of God. John 8, 24. Repenting of your sins. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. And publicly confessing Christ. Romans chapter 9, verses, or excuse me, chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Now it is interesting to note that these four steps, as we typically refer to them as, they only bring you unto salvation. However, many in the religious world today would claim that they bring salvation. That these steps are sufficient. Some teach that all you have to do is accept Jesus, believe in Him, and confess that you're a sinner. The ABCs of salvation. Well, I'm glad they know they're ABCs, but there's other letters left. This is an incorrect, this is a false doctrine. But nonetheless... These steps only bring you unto salvation. If you go unto your grocery store of choice, great, you're there, you're in the parking lot, but at what point do you go get groceries? When you go into said store. That's the difference in those four little words. 
Going unto something is nice. Going into is better. You think of how cold it has been recently. Of course, now it's a little bit warmer. Going unto somewhere where it's warm is not going to get you warm. Going into that home, that's where the heat is. You see, there's a fifth step in becoming a Christian. And that is immersion in water. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Being baptized into the remission of sins. Being baptized washes away your sins. Acts chapter 22, verse 16. Being baptized puts you into Christ. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. And 1 Peter chapter 3, 21. Baptism doth also now save us. Doth it or doth it not? Once these steps are com com completed, one becomes a Christian. The Christian must live faithful to God's word. Revelation chapter 2 verse 10. Yet sometimes the Christian sins through weakness or even of ignorance. This too can be remedied through repentance, confession, and prayer. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9. Now a secondary solution to the heart, pro <clears throat> the heart problem is found by being with the people of God. Fellowship. When one is faithful to God, he is in fellowship with God. 1 John chapter 1, verse 3 and verse 7. Thus, we are in fellowship and only in fellowship with all others who are in fellowship with God. Thus, we must seek those people out. If you need to visualize fellowship, I think the most simplest way to do that is thinking of a, a bicycle wheel. Where you have God in the middle and each of the spokes are the bonds of fellowship. When you get to the rim, those endpoints are the individual Christians. When everything is working correctly, that, bit, that bicycle is going to roll. If you lose a spoke, there's a problem. But God must be the center of our lives. Obeying Him brings fellowship. Secondly, worship. Worship of the faithful members of the church. Actually, faithful members of the church are the only ones qualified to worship God properly in spirit and in truth. John chapter 4, verse 24. Now, worshiping God in spirit and truth allows us to commune with Christ. Matthew chapter 26, verse 29. This allows us to correctly praise our Creator. And this assembly, particularly the type of assembly we're engaged in now, the first day of the week, must not, ought not be forsaken. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. And then much more in a generic sense, gathering with the brethren. Things outside of worship. Those things are meant to edify each of us as Christians. Acts chapter 2 verse 46. They met daily. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 19. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 14 and through 16. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 11. You know I've never understood. Why some choose not to assemble with the saints. Obviously, it's wrong to forsake the worship assembly. But what about devotionals that we used to have? Gathering for door knocking. Gathering for a gospel meeting. Lectureships. People come up with all sorts of excuses not to be there. Now, certainly there are reasons. But why would you not want to assemble with the brethren? If not for anything beyond edification. You've got to realize that heaven will only be occupied by those who have been faithful to God. Those members of the church who are indeed faithful. 
When you're around them, you have a small glimpse of heaven. Because after all, whenever we do get to heaven, as we've seen that song, when the saved get to heaven, who's going to be there? If we're all faithful, the faithful will all be there. Think who you're sitting next to. It's your brother in Christ, your sister in Christ. Why don't you want to spend time with them? Some people will choose to spend more time with those of the world over spending time with their brethren. The people we hang out with, spend more time with, they have a heavy influence on us, especially if we allow them to do so, which takes us to the concept of those evil thoughts. People of the world, they don't mind defiling themselves as we've discussed this morning. The Christian should be concerned about those things. Now, as we bring this lesson to a close, do we fully appreciate the severity of the sin problem? Specifically, how sin comes from the spiritually sick heart. Do we consider how easily we can become enslaved to sin? Do we realize the devastation that these defiling qualities cause regarding our relationship to God and even our brethren? And not just those of the church, our fellow man in general. Do we fully appreciate the solution to the problem? Do we appreciate the blood that Jesus shed for us to remit our sins, to provide that solution for the sin problem? I don't think any of us will fully appreciate that, but we can still grow in our appreciation for that sacrifice. Now this study was intended to serve to remind each and every one of us of the severity of man's heart problem. To remind us just how serious these defilements of the heart are. We're around them every single day of our lives. After all, we cannot be hermits hiding in a cave under a rock, locked up in our houses, fearing everything outside. We do need to conduct ourselves in this world. We can't escape the world. We must live in the world, but we must not be of the world. Thus, we have to deal with these different defilers on a regular basis. So are we willing to follow the prescription of the great physician. His invitation is always open. Are you guilty of those any of these defilements this morning that we've discussed? As one who has not obeyed the gospel of Christ and you see this fault in your life, why not take those steps to obey the gospel? If you need to study more, we'll be happy to do that with you. We have shown from the scriptures this morning exactly what you must do in order to obey the gospel and become a Christian. However, as a child of God, have you stumbled? Maybe you've engaged in these type of defilements. Maybe not. Again, as we have discussed, you have the ability to remedy that situation. To bring that relationship back in good standing between you and your creator. Why not take the necessary steps to make the changes this morning as together we stand and sing?